Good morning, you and family. My name is Vicki Williams, and I am the teacher of the Living Faith Sunday School class. Happy to have you with me this morning. We in our Living Faith class are currently in a book by Max Lucado called Six Hours, One Friday. We also have done many different books. Um, Chuck Swindoll has some excellent commentaries that we've done. We finished the entire book of Romans going verse by verse. We did Tony Evans' book called It's Not Too Late. And um, please join me this morning. We always bring our Bibles and take turns reading the Bible verses. Today I'll be reading, but grab your Bible. Today's scripture is found in John 11, verses 40 through 43. So turn along and follow with me. We're going to be talking about a passage that you're very familiar with. This is where Jesus has just probably done his most, um, most important, greatest miracle in his earthly ministry so far. He just is raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, let he gets to Lazarus um, after Lazarus has already been dead for four days. Even his sister Martha comments to Jesus that he would have begun to stink by now. But Jesus wasn't late to this gathering. Jesus is never late. He doesn't make a mistake by not coming when he was summoned originally by Mary and Martha. Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he had a reason for coming exactly when he came. So let's turn to John chapter 11 and start with verse 40. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up into heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Jesus and God the Father had already had a conversation about the subject of Lazarus and what the action would be that he would take. But by doing this, raising Lazarus from the dead, it proves once and for all, there is no denying it, that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Most of the time when we read this story, we stop right here at this verse. But the focus of our lesson today is what follows in the next passage. Let's go to verse 45 and 46. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen, but some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So all the people had witnessed the very same event, but there were two responses. Some of the people believed on Jesus and some of the people went running to the Pharisees to tattle on Jesus. We have the same opportunity today. We can believe on Jesus or we can reject Jesus as the Son of God. Um, let's go to verses 47 and 48. Then the leading priest and the Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? They ask each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. So now they have a committee meeting about the subject of what are we going to do about the problem of Jesus? The Pharisees had already made up their minds about him. It wasn't that they thought the story of Lazarus was fake news. These Pharisees also knew that Jesus had fed the multitudes, that he had healed blind Bartimaeus, that, and they know for a fact that Jesus had done many, many other miracles as well. There were plenty of eyewitnesses for all of that. They also knew that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, and they are afraid he may be. But wait a minute. These Pharisees are the most educated and respected Jews around. They know all about Jewish history. They believe in God. 
They believe that God chose them as a nation, that he singled them out as special, that he had done many miracles in their Jewish, Jewish history past, and they believe that um, God is with them. They believe that God parted the Red Sea, that he brought them out of Egypt, that he gave them the promised land, etc. These Jewish people had been waiting for this promised Messiah for thousands of years, and they had scriptures that had told them exactly what to look for. The Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. That verse was written in Micah. That he would flee to Egypt. Then he would return to Israel. He would do specific signs and wonders so that they would know that he was the Messiah. He was supposed to heal the sick, cast out demons, give sight to the blind, and raise the dead. Well, Jesus had done all of those things, so what's the problem? Jesus fills the build. They should be rejoicing, but they're not. Why not? They didn't want Jesus to be their promised Messiah. They wanted someone to be their new king, to take over the Romans. They wanted their Messiah to be wealthy, and powerful a warrior. Their own pride and prejudice only allowed thoughts that lined up with their theological, political, and social expectations of the Messiah. They wanted their Messiah to be like them. Their prejudice did not allow for a Messiah that had spent his ministry in Galilee with a bunch of uneducated, uncultured fishermen. They couldn't accept that Jesus socialized with tax collectors and harlots, that he was around poverty-stricken folks all the time. They couldn't accept that he chose to heal and help people that they thought of as undesirable. Nope, they didn't like this Jesus but they really showed their hand in verse 48. It says, if we don't stop him, then everybody will believe in him. And that would have forced a change in their circumstances. See, they were afraid of losing their positions, of losing their power, their control. They were blinded by their very long held traditions so they couldn't see the truth right in front of them. They were very comfortable in their lives. They got to make all of the rules, even if they didn't personally abide by them. They were looking out for their own self-interest, watching out for number one. And in case you haven't figured out politics yet, it is all about control. These Pharisees are afraid of losing their authority, their prominence in society, and possibly their jobs. Let's go to verse 49. Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time, said, You don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than the whole nation be destroyed. He did not say this on his own as high priest at that time. He was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation, and not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. See, Caiaphas, the high priest, was a really bad dude. He had done some bad things. He had used his position only to benefit himself. He didn't care about the people that he was leading. He was a corrupt leader. Maybe some of the other Pharisees rationalized their behavior. They just went along with the crowd. They were afraid to speak up. But before we continue to point the finger of shame only at the Pharisees, we need to remember that the Bible has taught us that we are all sinners. 
there is none righteous, no, not one. We too hide the truth if it means that that will keep us comfortable. Um, maybe we have a very narrow opinion of what we expect from our Messiah. Caiaphas is arrogant and he says, eliminate Jesus, wipe him out, better him than us. The Pharisees plotted for evil, but God used it for good. The Pharisees thought they were actually deciding the fate of Jesus in their meeting. They had no idea of exactly who they were dealing with. Nobody decides the fate of the Son of God. Jesus and his Father were in control of the situation. Turn back a chapter to John 10, verses 17 and 18. I'll read it. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. Jesus was eventually crucified. He did die. He was buried, but he rose again, and that was the plan. God was in control, and then he is also in control today, but that is not the end of the story. Jesus eventually ascended into heaven, and he left the Holy Spirit here with us. But Jesus is coming back. The trumpet will sound one day, and everyone will know, including unbelievers. And everyone will bow at the name of Jesus. There will be a resurrection. Humans that don't believe that are wrong. They're dead wrong. Listen to this story. This is a true story. It happened in the 1700s in Hanover, Germany. In a cemetery there, there is a grave on which was placed huge slabs of granite and marble. And they were cemented together and they were fastened with heavy steel clasps. This grave belongs to Henrietta Julianne Caroline von Ruwen. She lived from 1756 to 1782. She was a woman who so adamantly did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, yet strangely enough, she directed in her will that her grave be made so secure that even if she were wrong and there was a resurrection, it would not reach her. And on her grave marker were inscribed these words, May this tomb, bought for eternity, never be opened. But in time, a seed covered by these massive slabs of stone and concrete and cement and marble, a seed began to grow. And this seedling slowly over time pushed its way through the soil and out from beneath these slabs of marble. This plant grew, its trunk enlarged, and these great slabs were gradually shifted so much that the mighty steel clasp were wrenched from their sockets. A tiny seed that turned out to be a birch tree pushed aside the heavy stones. This unusual grave site drew a lot of attention of passers-by. I imagine that God laughed and said, seriously, you really think I can't open this grave? Our lesson is people today still have a choice to either believe in Jesus or not. Some people may choose not to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that he came to earth, that he suffered and died for our sins in our place. They may not believe that he rose from the grave 
or that he's coming back one day. But they would be wrong, dead wrong. If you are looking for absolute truth today, look to God. His word, the Bible, is truth. And you can be absolutely certain that God is still in control, still on the throne, even in all of this crazy pandemic world. Trust God. He is truth. That's our lesson for today. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day.